So speaking of leaders, our first panel is Why Leadership Matters in 2022 with Amy Barner Bond, Paulina Hanna, Rika Nakazawa, and Stephanie Lingle Beasley. I have been so excited about this panel all week. Uh, so really can't wait to hear the words from these amazing women. And Stephanie's company is Beasley and McCuster Communications. They produced the deck at the start of the program. So we'd like to thank her and her business partner, Carolyn, for all of the extra help with the event. I will turn it over to you, Stephanie, to introduce yourself, please, in this incredible panel. Thank you, Susan. Uh, just checking, my screen doesn't quite have the same view as others. Can everybody see me? Hopefully. Well, I'm just going to guess that you can <laughs> and go ahead and say thank you so much for having me here. We are thrilled to be back. Um, the amazing Susan Selinski invited uh, Carolyn McCusker and myself to participate in last year's uh, Hit Lab Women's Health Tech Challenge, and it was such an honor. Our company was created as a PR and communications and events firm to amplify the voices of women in tech, uh, whether it's venture, uh, female founders, or C-suite executives. So this is one of our favorite events, and we're, we're thrilled to be back. I'm going to jump right into the panel at hand. We're going to talk all about leadership, and we have three extraordinary women right now for me to introduce. The first one is Amy Barnard Bond. I have had the privilege of knowing Amy for, I think, maybe over 20 years. <laughs> she is an extraordinary woman. Uh, a former Fortune Global 50 executive, Amy is a consultant uh, to the C-suite and leaders in global companies like Bank of the West, Adobe, and The Gap. Recognized by Forbes as one of the top coaches for legal and compliance executives, she is a member of the Marshall Goodsmith 100 Coaches. Amy guest lectures at Stanford, at Berkeley, and is a contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and Compliance Week. She's also a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Coaching. She is the creator of the Promit Promotability Index, which I'm sure she'll tell us about in a little bit, and author of the companion PI Guidebook. Amy earned her law degree at Georgetown and her BA from Tufts. We're thrilled to have Amy here. Next up, Paulina Hannon. Paulina is the principal at Aquitus Partners. She is uh, she joined after spending eight years as a portfolio director of at Startup Health at Aquitus. Paulina works hand in hand with clients to redefine their recruitment strategy and make sure they have the people they need in their company to have an immediate impact. As a portfolio director at Startup Health, Paulina oversaw and managed a portfolio of 300 plus companies. She was the primary coach for entrepreneurs at all stages of the startup life cycle, helping them craft their story and lead their companies to raising more than $750 million. After joining Startup Health and gaining contracts from national institutions and growing their visibility, Polina got her start in the health space in the early 2000s at the Viscosley Brothers, where she held multiple roles with the firm's portfolio companies. Polina earned her BA at Wesleyan and her MBA at the University of Chicago. Thank you so much for being here, Polina. And last but not least, my dear friend Rika Nakazawa. Rika is a best selling author, she's a leader an investor and a frequent public speaker on technology powered business transformation. She is a senior executive at NTT as a group vice president for industry and where she is responsible for building the 5G and IoT consulting practice. Rika has worked with global roles for over two decades in senior positions in strategy, design thinking, business development, consulting, and marketing for Fortune 500 companies. She is a digital transformation expert and has served on multiple startup boards in next generation computing, blockchain, and artificial intelligence. We're thrilled to have Rika here. When this panel got together, we had the privilege of doing that a few days ago, we talked about what leadership meant to us and I loved it. All three ladies came back and said, what we wanna do is impart some really impactful, actionable ideas and best practices when we speak to the group on Friday. So here they are. And I'm going to start right now with Amy. And I'd like to ask you, Amy, what does it mean to build a great team? A leader has to build a great team. 
and what actions can leaders take in their organizations to support and create an environment where women are supported and have the opportunity to advance? Oh, Amy, we need your, your <laughs> turn your mic on, please. Thank you. Sorry, I'd had it <laughs> muted <laughs> so that it's I didn't know right, all the great stuff you were saying. The first, I, I would say there are three actions, just to keep it simple, that leaders and organizations need to create a good, strong working environment to support women's advancement. And the first is visibility. We all know that in general, men have access to more powerful networks than we do. And women are working on this. Um, we've got things going on, but it's still the case that men have more access. More men are CEOs and they're involved in high level clubs and networks. Um, and I, in my coaching practice, see this because now that we're remote, I get very concerned about proximity bias, which is if they're, you're close to the situation, you get the better deals, you're viewed as more loyal, you're viewed as more promotable. Um, and there's a psychological you know, neurology around the people you see the most and have access to you, you feel an affinity for. So um, a lot of the clients that I coach have already been remote in a way for a long time. They're, I coach globally, and so they were dispersed all around the globe. But I think companies being aware of um, consciously how they give assignments, consciously who they're contacting with, um, and finding a way to equalize that is really important. So that's the first thing I would say. The second is to have more transparent and objective criteria for promotion. Having been a former chief human resources officer and in HR for many years and other, and other executive roles, I can tell you um, it's, it's quite subjective when it really gets down to the final choices, especially close to the top. So I'm a huge proponent and have spoken significantly in the past year, especially with the, promot the Promotability Index that you mentioned, the book that I wrote, which was deconstructing promotions with objective criteria and reverse engineering that so that companies can hopefully overcome inherent bias and subjectivity in promotions. Um, and then third, women need sponsorship from women or male allies. And you really need somebody to speak for you in the room when you're not there um, concerning promotions or plum assignments, someone who's willing to vouch their reputation on you. So every woman and man of power who wants to advance women should be sponsoring at least one woman they believe in and that they would stake their reputation on. Terrific advice. Polina, you know, as uh, you're, you're, you've got a unique perspective from the executive search side. You were with the health tech startups to begin with. What What's key for building teams right now? Yeah, so we're seeing um, that there's quite the bull market for candidates these days. A lot of it has been precipitated by just the type of innovation that's actually coming to market today certainly fueled by the urgency that COVID has created in order to in order to really innovate within this space and give access to the technologies and service that we all deserve. And obviously investors are paying attention. So there's a lot of capital that's flowing into this system. So what's happened as a result of that is high quality talent and high quality leaders are in really, really high demand uh, to make sure that we can actually achieve the really big and audacious goals that uh, the CEOs and the founders of great organizations have set up for themselves. So there's a couple of things that you can do as a founder to really set yourself up for success. One is before you go out to actually find an individual to fill a particular spot, make sure that you have the right spec. So that means uh, that you have the right titling and leveling to make sure that you're going out to market to find the leaders that are going to be great within the organization, given where your organization is today versus where it's going to be 24 months from now. The other component is actually to run a really tight process. Uh, we've seen over the last uh, 18 months that processes for hiring, particularly executives and leaders, have significantly shortened. So what that means is that you don't have the time in order to sit on a candidate that you really like and you need to move things through. A candidate should know exactly what the process is going to look like before really entering into conversations with your firm and you need to be decisive. 
The other component is going to be compensation. Uh, we are seeing uh, salaries rise across the board, but particularly for seed stage companies, that doesn't mean that you need to be overpaying uh, for executives just to get them in. So there may be some creative structures that you can create through bonuses, through other incentives and through equity to make sure that you have the, the right folks in the mix who are also going to be committed. Don't sleep on the, and to be honest, don't sleep on the fact that any person that you bring in needs to be committed to your mission. Take a chance on that rising star, maybe somebody who doesn't necessarily check all your must-have boxes so that you're searching for that unicorn individual. A person who actually is passionate about your business will make much more of an impact versus somebody who knows how to do the job, but who isn't excited to get up and work alongside you and run through all the hurdles every single day. So all of, the, all of that should set you up for success to be able to build up the team in fairly short order. Fantastic advice. Rika, you come at this, uh, well, the last couple of years, your focus has been on boards and really, really getting diversity on boards. And if you don't have the leadership coming from the board, you're in big trouble. So tell us from, from your perspective what leadership today is right now for, for the board situation. Yeah, I think, and by the way, I just want to do a big thanks to, to Nicole and Susan for this opportunity and, and the chance to have to be on this panel with uh, such luminaries as Amy and Paulina. So I'm um, very humbled and very excited. Um, as you point out, Stephanie, and you know the, the work that I've been doing with boards. And what's been interesting is, yes, the past couple of years have been pretty laser focused. And I would say within that time period, there's also been this evolution of, of the, the, the board profile and, and desirable candidates. Um, coming out of COVID-19, for example, uh, the board profile is, is looking more dimensionalized. And, and as, as Amy was saying, uh, you know, the, the, the network and the access is going to be key and access both ways. I think for boards that want to bring in diverse leaders because those diverse leaders are gonna be more representative of their constituents or the customer, especially in the healthcare arena. Um, I think you know one of the things that really became very clear and present was really this this um, uh, health equity piece, right, and access to 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 uh, to treatments and whatnot, and the the inequities around that. So really being able to have that diverse board, so that the the board needs access to diverse candidates, and diverse candidates need access to those conversations with senior leaders in the boardroom, and ultimately it's also about having the pipeline. Uh, just because you have a vast pool of, of very uh, high potential talent and underrepresented leaders doesn't solve the problem in and of itself. I think it's really around the, the, the board really being meaningful and mindful about cultivating that pipeline as well within either within the organization or within, within the broader community. And given that COVID-19 has also demonstrated the smallness of the world, I think what's, what's happened as well with board Boards, is that boards are now realizing that that the, the, pro, the geography isn't going to be a constraint, right? So there's more opportunities as you're looking to diversify your board, and especially for those ventures that are looking to have a global solution at some point on their journey. I think it's good to, to stay focused in it at first if you are in a geography. But as you're looking to expand your business, there really is a tremendous opportunity now to diversify the board with people from other countries, for example. Um, and again, especially as you think about the global footprint opportunity that your venture may have. And so those are the things that uh, I've seen becoming much more pronounced. In addition to the whole, um, with, the, with respect to the profile, what I was gonna mention is that because of COVID-19, there's been this huge impact on people and talent and hence the, the important work that Paulina is doing. But the CHRO, prior to COVID-19 wasn't necessarily the most obvious board profile to bring in, but given that the pandemic has really had organizations kind of stop and say, okay, it's, you know, we, we need to have somebody on the board that's really going to be able to speak from that perspective. And again, that speaks to the board diversity, right? So board diversity isn't just about gender diversity and LGBTQ and racial. It's really about having that diversity within the board that are really going to be able to understand various functions of the organization because the whole 
digital transformation mandate, right, which is a product of mass digitalization that's happened because we've had to because of COVID-19 has really brought other additional stakeholders around that table in terms of the leadership of the board and the responsibility of access both ways from the board access to talent, building the pipeline, and of course, enabling that talent to have access to that to that to that boardroom because ultimately it that provides that win-win and then as i mentioned uh realizing that the opportunity now is really to be able to dimensionalize your board with with uh people that aren't necessarily in the country right that can bring in perspectives from from overseas as well you're on mute stephanie <laughs> Oh, um, wanted to bring it back to you, Amy, and you can turn on turn on your mic as well. Um, I have to mention, you know, it's COVID and craziness and working at home and my puppy's barking in the background. So I'm sticking myself on mute in between. Okay, anyway. My dog's holding my, my, my husband's holding my dog under a pillow. There you go. <laughs> exactly. So. A crazy new world we're in. Yeah. But uh, Amy wanted to talk about, you know, it's no secret men and women handle challenges incredibly differently. What are some reasons that you think women don't advance in their careers as quickly as men? There are many, uh, and too many to get into here, but I'm going to share three that we can act on because I like moving insight to action. So as everyone in this whole forum is likely experienced, we know that women are often underestimated. And studies, including a recent Yale University study, show that men are promoted based on potential, whereas women are judged based on their past performance. The challenge with this is that potential is subjective. So this negatively impacts women more, and subjective performance standards create bias. Um, so companies need to really take a good look at their performance processes and adopt objective standards. And with the great resignation, there's really never been a better time to invest in your talent, to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations around careers, understand where people want to grow and do the best you can to give them that opportunity. Um, second, and this is a big one, studies also show that women and people of color are given less actionable feedback than men. And I, I personally have not had a chance yet to dig into this in my writing and research, but I believe there's probably been a backlash after BLM and Me Too in a fear of um, people being given that feedback, particularly by, by the white men that, that generally have the power, frankly, to help promote. Um, we have to get the feedback. Um, I see this in my coaching all the time. I solicit critical performance feedback from people who are getting blocked. Um, and I get feedback and leadership perceptions from the C-suite that they do not tell my client directly and would not know, issues that can stall their career. So actionable feedback is absolutely critical to advancement and promotion. And so if we want equitable treatment, we've got to do a better job at giving and receiving feedback, radical candor. And then third, I would say companies need to adopt pay equity hygiene. I, I recently wrote an HBR article on how to identify and fix pay equity at your organization. And for startups, you may not be in a mature stage where you've really got enough job families and all that stuff for this to be a problem, but in a large company or as you scale and grow, it creeps in and it creeps in pretty quickly. Um, once you hit particularly like 150 employees, I would say um, the Malcolm Gladwell kind of magic number. And um, so if anyone's interested, I'm happy to share the article. I'll put it in the chat, but I outline the issue, how it happens and actions companies can take to conduct pay equity audits. And they should do it regularly um, to make sure that it's not creeping in. And there are other great business reasons to do a pay equity audit besides gender, but that's, that's a really good one. So those are the three things I would suggest. Thank you so much. Rika, I'm gonna take it right back to you real quick. There's obviously lots of work to be done on, on the whole equity idea. Um, but how have opportunities for women shifted as gender balanced teams take steps forward toward creating a more empathetic environment? Yeah, so what's what's been interesting through some of the research that I've been doing for Strides and, and for the book is that uh, I think 
what I've heard anecdotally is that a, a number of the women that are gaining the board roles, and again, when I talk about board roles, people tend to think of the public company boards, but I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that the role of the board member, whether it's a public company board, is as important and strategic for a startup board or a private equity board, right? We need to think about the whole panoply of, of different kind of board roles. And, and, and if you are an aspiring board member, in addition, in addition to being an entrepreneur, or, or a venture capitalist is to um, acknowledge that, that the anecdote that I have is that the, the women that are gaining board seats have been the digital transformation and the digital uh, professionals, right? The ones that can kind of, that can come in and give a perspective on this new era of, of, of digital transformation. And so that's, that's one thing that I think about because that's really key, right? As we all barrel forward into the metaverse I think maybe um, is 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 that opportunity that that women have to be able to be that orchestrator across the board because when we talk about digital that's not confined to a function within an organization it's very holistically thinking about that and I think that plays to also um, this again about leadership about this empathetic leader really being key. Uh, for the future and not to say that women are more empathetic than men, it has more to do with historical permissibility of being of, of having empathy in the conversation versus just logic black and white, it is uh, more likely to happen in gender balanced rooms and in leadership and so this opportunity and by the way again COVID-19 being a catalyst for the, the need for empathy right and just even as simple as having to hold your dog under the pillow or have kids running into the room and all these things. We've all been there and we, it's, it's all become very human. And uh, the, you know, in the, in the past, I've done a lot of work around human-centered design as part of design thinking. And so that's really become much more forefront of the, the future of leadership in the board and, and really having the, the gender balance that enables that empathetic way of, of thinking about how we're collectively gonna to work together to get on the other side and ultimately, the best way that you can solve for problems and why, again, diversity plays a role in this is because you have those people that can come from the perspective of other and all the stakeholders that are around the table for how you are successful as a business, as an, as an enterprise. That's fantastic. We are at time, but Paulina, um, just because we're running out, I'm going to give you one of the lightning round questions and then we've got to wrap it up. Um, I just want to, you know, if you had to give a piece of advice to a young entrepreneur, what would it be? Follow that mission. Follow That's that going to be your North Star. Follow it. Beautiful. Thank you, Rika, Amy, Polina. What a pleasure. Susan, back to you. Oh, thank you so much. I have to tell you, this was just amazing. I had high hopes for this panel and you four never disappoint. So thank you. Really, really appreciate it and, and realize you're very busy. So it means a lot to have you here.